Thanks for joining me today as I continue preaching through the book of Colossians here at Kenmore Community Church. My name is Mark Rogers. I'm the pastor and it's a joy to have you tuning in online. I want to encourage you to make sure you have your Bible close by and uh, today we're going to be uh, looking at Colossians chapter 2 verses 16 through 23 and I'll uh, encourage you to open your Bible to that passage so that you can follow along as I preach through those verses. Let's begin with prayer though, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word and to worship you. And Father, there is uh, a lot going on in our world today, and we need you. We need your help. Uh, Lord, we pray for this COVID virus uh, situation. Uh, we seem to be having another surge of infections here in our nation and in our state. And Lord, we just pray for an end to this virus. We pray uh, for... Um, healing of those who are sick with it. We pray for the researchers who are seeking uh, drugs and a vaccine to combat it and we just pray for their success and we pray that soon we'll be able to move past all of these uh, various restrictions that we're having to deal with because of this virus. We also want to be in prayer today for our nation Lord as we're facing a, uh, an election in about a week and a half and many people are casting their votes. We pray for wisdom and guidance and pray that uh, godly men and women would be elected to positions of leadership in our nation. Uh, men and women who are committed to you Lord and desire to do your will and honor you uh, and serve you in their positions and uh, we know Lord that you uh, have ordained uh, governments and that you raise up leaders and you take down leaders and so Lord we're just trusting you and we know that whoever is elected you are still sovereignly in control of all things and uh, you reign supreme and so we trust completely in you uh, for the outcome of this election and Father we also want to pray uh, for ourselves today we pray Lord that you would forgive us for our wrongdoing that uh, you would fill us with your spirit and the fruit of the spirit would be evident in our lives. We pray that in our thoughts, attitudes, and actions we might become more and more like Jesus. And Father, here at Kenmore Community Church, we want to pray for our families of the week. We pray for Cheryl Bowes and Liz Bowes, for um, uh, Kevin and Stacy Brooks, and for Aaron from our youth group. We lift these folks to you, Lord, and we pray for your blessing, your encouragement, uh, in their life, we pray for their spiritual growth and maturity, for their health and well-being. We also want to pray for uh, our mission focus today, which is the Beck family in Austria. We thank you for the work they're doing there that they have done in helping uh, uh, Persian-speaking immigrants to that country. And now they transition to church, planting a church in a, uh, a very unchurched part of Austria and so we pray for the success of that ministry and especially as they're seeking to reach out to more families and they're starting a, a children's Christian scouting program there we pray uh, for the success of that and that they'll be able to connect with more and more families there and now father as we turn to studying your word once again uh, we pray for open ears open eyes uh, we pray for um, just uh, your Holy Spirit to illuminate your word to us today and we pray it in Jesus name Amen well in our ongoing study of Colossians as I mentioned I'm going to be preaching today from chapter 2 verses 16 through 23 and this is uh, part 2 of a two-part uh, uh, series here from the uh, really uh, most of chapter 2 in Colossians uh, last week I introduced it, um, and this week I'll conclude that two-part series from this chapter, really dealing with pulling the weeds of legalism. Uh, you will remember uh, that the occasion that uh, prompted Paul to write this letter to the church at Colossae was the fact that there were some false teachers that were seeking to infiltrate the church there with their thoughts and ideas. And uh, basically these uh, false teachings 
were uh, uh, amounted to legalism and uh, within that legalism there was some mysticism and some asceticism as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few moments, but Paul is writing to remind the Colossian believers and us that our uh, salvation is complete in Christ. You can't add anything uh, to Christ. We are complete in Christ. It's not Christ plus our good works or something else that saves us. Uh, our salvation is complete in Christ. And these false teachers were trying to convince the believers there in Colossae that they need to, needed to add the special knowledge that these false teachers had in order to truly be saved and to be spiritual and to be accepted uh, by God. And so uh, that's... Uh, Chapter 2 is really dedicated to this, and the, the first part of that message that I gave last week, uh, Paul reminded us of what we have in Christ, that we are complete in Christ, uh, that we are completely forgiven in Christ, and that we are made spiritually alive in Christ. Everything we need for our salvation and our spiritual growth is found in Christ. Nothing more uh, should be added to it, can be added to it, or needs to be added to it. So in this passage today, Paul outlines a little bit more specifically exactly what the uh, contents of these false teachers were uh, presenting to these Colossian believers, and he, he tells us uh, how and why we need to resist those false teachings, which again basically boiled down to a form of legalism that had some mysticism and some asceticism uh, uh, contained in it. So let me read those verses, Colossians chapter 2, 16 through 23. Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. So if we want to pull the weeds of legalism in our lives, uh, we must resist its lures. That's what Paul is focusing on here in this section. First of all, he tells us to refuse to judge and be judged by externals. Look again at verses 16 and 17. Paul says, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with, re or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, you should always ask what it's there for. Paul is drawing a conclusion based on what he has just written previously. Since Jesus has done what was necessary for our salvation and we are complete in him, don't let other people evaluate your spiritual life by their external standards. Legalism judges spirituality by external conformity to certain rules. Christ plus uh, rules is the key to a greater spirituality according to the legalists. And they have rules, Paul says, about, first of all, he talks about rules about your diet. These false teachers in Colossae apparently were in insisting that this mostly Gentile congregation had to abide by some dietary restrictions found in the Mosaic Law. And they had rules about special days. The false teachers in Colossae were also apparently insisting that this mostly Gentile congregation had to practice some of the religious rituals and festivals which were re rooted in the Mosaic Law. Christ plus a bunch of rules will not lead us into genuine sp spirituality there has to be a transformation right here of the heart. Every system of religious falsehood 
seeks to duplicate grace by works. The same rules can be followed by the unregenerate, giving them the appearance of righteousness and spirituality, but in reality they are not genuine followers of Jesus because there is no transformation of the heart. Legalists also never keep the whole law. They pick certain laws to observe which they think they can obey and by which then they can judge others. Legalism always has a cultural face when it comes to rules. They differ from community to community and country to country. Therefore, you know they're not, you know, you know they're not eternal truths. They're they're made up rules that uh, are cultural and they change from community to community. If you were uh, to go from America to Africa, you would find different legalistic kind of cultural rules that uh, legalistic uh, believers. Uh, have implemented. In our day, here are some of the legalistic rules you might encounter in the United States. Uh, uh, use or non-use of alcohol, uh, smoking, uh, the length of hair on men, uh, whether or not women should wear dresses to church, uh, whether women should wear makeup and jewelry, uh, going to movies or certain uh, r movies that are rated R or above, uh, ladies' hairstyles. In other words, uh, you know, legalists would argue that, that women should have long hair and not short hair. Uh, the type of worship music that is uh, uh, played and sung in churches. Uh, uh, their legalists argue about the English translation of the Bible that you use and uh, your view of the end times. We must avoid taking our preferences, coding them in spiritual verbiage, and insisting that others, other believers, must adopt them or they're not genuine followers of Christ. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. He, he talked about this happening uh, as time drew uh, to a close. He says, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. The Mosaic Law... Uh, the Mosaic Law dietary restrictions, religious rituals, and Sabbaths, Paul tells us, are a shadow. They were a shadow of the things that were to come, but the reality is found in Christ. The reality is found in Jesus. The dietary restrictions of the Mosaic Law were meant to set God's people apart from the surrounding pagan nations and to remind them that they were God's holy people. Every time they sat down to a meal, they had to evaluate, is this food something that God has said is okay to eat? And, and it reminded them that they were set apart to God, that they were meant to be holy to Him. But today our holiness is found in our union with Christ. We have exchanged our sin for the imputed righteousness of Christ. And in a similar fashion, the religious festivals and Sabbath laws in the Mosaic Law have also been fulfilled in Christ. I'll just give you one example, the Passover celebration. That Passover celebration where the Israelites were told at the time of the Exodus, if you remember, to paint their doorposts with the blood of a lamb and that the, then the angel of death, which was the final plague upon the Egyptians, killing the firstborn son in every family, the angel of death would pass over their homes if they had the blood of the lamb pa painted on their doorposts. Well, that festival then, uh, that celebration was uh, uh, put into the Mosaic Law and the Israelites were to celebrate and to remember that every year. But it pointed forward to the final Passover lamb who was Jesus Christ. Now that Jesus has come, the final Passover, the final Passover lamb has been sacrificed and it's by his blood that we are saved, that we are ma made right with God and we are spared uh, from his wrath. So we no longer have to celebrate the Passover in that sense. We can celebrate it in the sense that it meant to point to Christ and we celebrate the fact that Christ fulfilled it. The earlier Passover celebration was a shadow 
pointing forward to uh, how Christ would ultimately fulfill that. And then when we think about the Sabbath days, uh, Jesus is also the fulfillment of, what was pic fulfillment of what was pictured and practiced in the weekly Sabbath. In Hebrews uh, chapter 4, we read that Jesus is our Sabbath rest. In him, we can rest from our labor of law-keeping in order to be justified in the sight of God. Uh, according to Hebrews chapter 4, 1 through 7, those who believe in Jesus have entered into God's rest permanently. Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't physically take a break from our labors one day a week. That's still a good idea. But we don't need to do it in obedience to the Old Testament law in order to be justified in God's sight. That Sabbath rest was meant to point forward to the rest that we find in Jesus Christ. The opposite extreme from legalism is license. And this is where the legalists argue that, well, if, if you don't boil Christianity down to a list of do's and don'ts, then uh, believers are just going to think they can go do whatever they want, that they put their faith and trust in Christ, and they can then just go live their life any way they want, and keep on sinning, and, and just come back to God, and uh, ask His forgiveness, and, and think that they'll be forgiven, and, and they can just, you know, do whatever they want. It's a license for, for sin. And that's not the case. That's not the case. Uh, uh, believers don't have a license to go and sin freely and just keep on asking God for forgiveness. Genuine followers of Christ, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit dwells in us and transforms us. Part of the work of the Holy Spirit is to transform us more and more into the likeness of Christ so that our thoughts, attitudes, and actions become more Christ-like. Part of the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of our sins. And uh, we then repent of our sins and we become more and more like Jesus. So uh, our expressions of liberty are to be controlled by the law of love. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. But we don't obey in order to earn ground, brownie points with God. We obey out of love because of all that Christ has done for us. And our obedience is empowered by the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. So the argument of the legalist that, you know, if we don't have this set of rules, a uh, list of do's and don'ts that, that you've got to check off every day, then uh, believers are just going to willy-nilly uh, sin freely, and that's not the case. We live by the law of Christ. So pull the weeds of legalism by refusing to judge or be judged by external rules that are established by human beings and not based on the Word of God. The second thing Paul tells us to do in terms of pulling the weeds of legalism is to reject false authority. Let me read again verses 18 to 19. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection from the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. In other words, Paul is telling us that legalism stems from and leads to pride. And he describes the false teachers in Colossae in four ways. They have a false humility. They present themselves as humble and holy through their fasting and dietary practices. And they do that, by the way, in order to uh, receive uh, what they say are visions from God, but in reality, they're filled with spiritual pride and superiority. In other words, we, we practice this fasting and these dietary issues, and God gives us visions, and so, you know, we have knowledge that you don't have, and so you need to listen to us, and so they have this air of pride and superiority, even though they present it with this idea of false uh, humility. Uh, Paul says they worship angels. The, the false teachers believe that angels determine the course of the cosmos and the circumstances of human beings, so they worship them and prayed to them. Their focus is on other spiritual beings rather than on Christ. Uh, they claim they've seen these visions, and, and they love to give people the, the latest word from the Lord. Let me tell you what my vision from God was. And there's no sense that their vision is submitted to the authority of Christ. They're puffed up with idle notions. Their inner secrets gave them big heads. 
but not burning hearts to submit to and follow Christ. They are full of pride. Believers must submit to Christ as head of his body, the church. And Paul is saying that these false teachers have separated themselves from the head, who is Christ. Uh, Paul says that because of their subjective bias and experiential expressions, they'd actually become disconnected from the head, again, who is Christ. They were severed from any hope of spiritual vitality because they were not getting their uh, orders from Christ and their authority from Christ. Genuine believers must make sure we are not seeking experiences uh, that do not correlate with Christ. Even though is a, there's a fascination with religious mysticism, our focus is to be on Jesus and his authority. Paul tells the believers in Colossae not to let the false teachers disqualify them for the prize. Now here he was probably using an athletic metaphor saying that these false teachers set themselves up as judges, making up their own rules. And if you didn't play by their rules, they disqualified you from the contest. They may have said that you were not saved or at the very least you lost your rewards in heaven if you didn't obey their rules. And this was incorrect. They have no, no authority to disqualify anybody. The same goes today. False teachers have no, I, no authority to tell us we are not saved or will miss out on our rewards in heaven. We are to submit to the authority of Christ. The third thing that Paul tells us to do in this uh, passage to, uh, refute, uh, the, to refute legalism is to repudiate religious rules. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned, the problem of controlling sinful desires has plagued the human race. Whether we call it the flesh, the old nature, or indwelling sin, we all wrestle with strong internal temptations to do wrong, don't we? So, in a very, uh, so a very practical question is, how can we keep the flesh in check? Now, one answer, which is not limited to Christians, has been to treat the body harshly in an attempt to gain mastery over it what we call asceticism. In Colossians 2 verses 20 to 23, Paul shows that asceticism is not how to become godly, is not how you become godly. The false teachers in Colossae had a system of rules which they imposed on their followers, and he mentions some of those rules. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Uh, they said, if you keep these rules, you will have victory over fleshly desires. They took some of the Old Testament regulations concerning ceremonial cleanliness and diet and added to them much as the Pharisees had done. And Paul admits in Colossians uh, 2.23 that these rules had the appearance of wisdom, but he adds they are really of no value against fleshly indulgence because there's no transformation that happens on the inside. You can't will yourself to godliness. Rather, Paul argues that godliness is not achieved through asceticism but through our identification with Christ. So let's talk a little bit about asceticism. Um, godliness isn't achieved through asceticism. Uh, what is asceticism? Webster defines it as relating to or having a strict and simple way of living that avoids physical pleasure. Uh, the Oxford Dictionary defines it this way, uh, characterized by severe self-discipline and abstention from all forms of indulgence, typically for religious reasons. But if asceticism is self-denial, then isn't that taught in the Bible? Well, Paul said that he disciplined his mind and made it his slave. In 1 Corinthians 9.27, he instructed Timothy to endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ Jesus and to discipline himself for the purpose of godliness. That's in 1 Timothy 4.7. Uh, Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians 5.23. Jesus said that self-denial is an essential requirement for following him, that we are to, not, to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. So what's the difference between asceticism that Paul attacks in this text and biblical self-denial or self-discipline? Well, let me give you a number of uh, contrasts to consider. Asceticism sees the body as evil, to be totally suppressed. Self-discipline sees the body as good, but needing control. These false teachers probably taught that matter is evil, but spirit is good. Thus, we must treat our bodies harshly. 
But the Bible teaches that as Christians, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Thus, we need to take care of our bodies and to glorify God with them. That's, uh, uh, you know, from 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Uh, asceticism is submitting my body to my will. Self-discipline is submitting my whole life to God's will. The ascetic operates on willpower. His or her goal is to bring his or her body under the control of his or her mind or spirit. But Christian self-denial has a higher aim, namely to glorify Jesus by bringing my whole being into submission to him. Asceticism views joy and pleasure as wrong. Self-discipline allows for the fullness of joy and pleasure in God. God is the one who created us, and he has given us uh, certain desires and things, and he's given us a creation in which to enjoy. Asceticism is restrictive. Self-discipline leads really to greater freedom. Asceticism emphasizes all the things you cannot do. Don't handle this. Don't touch this. Don't taste this. It leads to a restrictive, repressive kind of life, but self-discipline is the key to liberty. Think about it this way. The disciplined athlete is free to do things that I cannot do. Somebody that works out every day, that, that walks miles every day, that, 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 that climbs hills every day, they're free to climb Mount Rainier. I'm not because I haven't been self-disciplined, and so I'm not free uh, to do that. The skillful musician has disciplined uh, himself over hours of practice so that he is free to play a Beethoven symphony that I could never play. Uh, I took piano lessons for a, a year or so when I was younger, and at one point I, you know, I could play uh, most of the keys, and I could play some uh, moderately difficult songs, but I haven't kept up the discipline for that, so about all I can play on the piano now is chopsticks or a note here and there, but, but I can't play a, a, a symphony or a cantata or sonatina or something like that because I haven't been self-disciplined, so I'm not free to do that. Um, and the disciplined Christian has freedom in the Lord to obey him and not to sin, which is always for our good. So again, asceticism is restrictive, whereas self-discipline leads to greater freedom. Asceticism is aimed at obeying man-made commands. We've talked about that a little bit. Uh, the, the, the legalists in Colossae, they, they took some of the Old Testament commands, but they added their own uh, restrictions to it. Uh, Self-discipline, though, is aimed at obeying God's commands, not man-made commands. Asceticism stems from the flesh and often leads to sin. Self-discipline stems from the Holy Spirit and is a means to true godliness. The Colossian heretics were puffed up in their minds, or prideful, Paul says. Uh, verse 23 says that while the rules of the false teachers may seem to promote godliness, in, actual, in actuality they're of no value in restraining sensual indulgence. Many people erroneously think that legalism is on one end of the scale and licentiousness is on the other, with grace being the balance point in the middle. But actually, legalism and licentiousness are two sides of the same coin because both operate in the flesh, not by the spirit. Thus, Jesus accused the legalistic Pharisees of being full of self-indulgence, all uncleanness and lawlessness in Matthew chapter 23. Their man-made rules and outward restrictions could not deal with the flesh. Only the Holy Spirit living in us can make us holy by producing the fruit of self-control. Asceticism is often motivated by gaining acceptance from God, whereas self-discipline is motivated by assurance of being accepted by God. The, the ascetic is often trying to make himself acceptable to God through harsh treatment uh, of his body. Um, by this he thinks that he can atone for his sins or show enough contrition to merit God's favor. But Christian self-discipline operates from the platform of knowing that God has already accepted us in Jesus Christ on the basis of his grace. Uh, the motive behind self-discipline is not to gain God's favor, but to be pleasing to the Lord because he loved me and died for me. Well, you might ask, if asceticism isn't the way to godliness, then what is? Well, Paul tells us, godliness is achieved through identification with Christ. The key verse is found uh, in uh, verse 20. Since you have died with Christ, if we know Christ as Savior, then we are in him 
uh, we were in him when he died on the cross. The law of God had put a curse on the human race uh, because we all have violated it repeatedly. We stand condemned under its penalty of death. But Jesus, born under the law, perfectly fulfilled it. His death met the just requirement of the law. And because we are in him, we also died to the law. It no longer has power or jurisdiction over us who are in Christ. And we are free now and empowered by the Holy Spirit to obey the law of Christ, which is the law of love. Now you may not feel or experience this truth, but it's a legal fact in God's sight. We have died with Christ. Our sins died with Christ on the cross. Our self-centered nature, our sinful nature, died with Christ on the cross if we have put our foot, faith and trust in Him. And uh, uh, we need to just act upon that truth. It frees you from the cycle of sin and death under the law and enables you, through God's Spirit, to live a life of holiness. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verses 19 to 20, For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Godliness comes through our identification with Christ in his death, and therefore the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit in our life to live a holy life. Godliness does not come through the rules, keeping legalism, uh, of asceticism, and uh, mysticism, and these man-made rules and regulations that these false teachers in Colossians were trying to put upon the believers there. So we need to reject that, we need to refute that, and trust in the fact uh, that in Christ we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us and the Holy Spirit empowers us to live a life of holiness in response to the love that God has shown us in Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you that we are complete in Christ, and I pray for each one of us that we would be able to resist the lures of legalism uh, and mysticism and asceticism. Lord, help us uh, to remember who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, that we are complete in Christ, and to refuse to judge or be judged by man-made rules that others would put forward saying, this is what leads to godliness, and this is what identifies a person as godly. Uh, help us to continue to trust um, in our salvation, which is complete in Christ, and to be empowered by the Holy Spirit out of a motive of love for Christ, the loving uh, His commands because we love Him and, and we want to glorify and honor Him. And, and we just trust that your Holy Spirit will continue to uh, empower us and transform us more and more into the likeness of Christ. And when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, help us to repent of that sin. And, um, and, and again, just focus on living out the law of love in Christ. And I pray today again, Lord, if anybody is listening today who's never put their faith and trust in Jesus, that maybe has been uh, trapped by uh, legalism in their past or even in their present, Lord, that you would help them to see how flawed that, that way to spirituality is. Godliness doesn't come that way, and that it comes and is found completely in Christ. And I pray that those folks would put their faith and trust in Jesus today. We pray it all in his name. Amen. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' name, amen.